So, as most of us know, there are extremely high energy injuries and have a lot of associated uh, number and variety of associated uh, uh, traumas. You can have ex other extremity injuries, you know, visceral injuries associated. Typically, in such situations in trauma, we can never forget uh, ATLS. And so that has to be stuck to, you know, primary and secondary survey and follow the protocol. The goals of, you know, fixation of pelvic fractures or pelvic injuries, first and foremost is to, you know, make a diagnosis of mechanical instability, you know, that, that, that's very, very important. Then after that, we have to pick up hemodynamic instability because mechanical instability usually is associated with dynamic instability. <laughs> yes. Okay. And the other thing is that you have to diagnose open pelvic injuries because we're dealing with life-threatening problems. And after you pick up open pelvic injuries, very key is to do a good debridement and a diverting colostomy. One of the things we have come to realize is that, you know, sometimes it's not so much about the location of the injury, it's the degree of displacement. Like, you know, in this image, as you can see, there's a destruction of the, of, of the, of the sacrum. And because of the degree of displacement, you're likely to have a neurologic injury, like in this patient who had L2 to L4 fallout. Morel Lavalli lesions should not be forgotten. A good number of them get infected if they're not picked up. They always require a debridement, which can be done staged or can be done at the, at the time of the definitive fixation. A good example is this one, a huge one, very obvious. You can be able to pick it up, open it up and drain it. But sometimes they are subtle and you have to look, have an aerial view of both, you know, uh, hips. And so when you look, you can see what I usually call an unequal buttock or an equal, you know, uh, hip. This side, you can see there's a mound, here it's flat. And this patient actually had a very bad injury. He had both a subcutaneous and, uh, and, and what, and subfacial uh, degloving. So actually ended up needing debridement and actually ended up two drains. Both one is subcutaneous, one deep in the fascia. The other thing to always remember in the pelvis, very, very key, is a third of patients have got what we call a dysmorphic pelvis. It's a problem of segmentation. You know, what people have called lumbar sacro segmentation problems, you know, and have all different classifications. The importance of this is very key is because if at all you're going to be putting a screw, this is the SI joint right in here. If you're going to be putting a screw across for this normal pelvis, it's very easy to have a corridor across. But for this one, because of the dysmorphism, you can see the way they are sloping on the 3D right on either side, okay? So if you're trying to put a, a sacroiliac screw across, you can see you're not able to go directly across. You know, you're putting like a transacral screw. You'll end up in the foramina. And so you actually have to only put, you know, you'd be forced to use almost like navigation or, or S2 screw to be able to, you know, stabilize those sacroiliac joints is because of how they are slanted. So it's always good to remember that. And that's very important. You're going to look at it in a short while. You know, I'm going to talk a little bit about percutaneous techniques, a good number of them. So that's, that's where everything is going. And that's very important. Traditional methods of fixation, fixation have always been, you know, uh, you know, using, you know, uh, big plates, sacro bars, plating the SI joint, but things have changed. Why? Because all those methods are associated with disadvantages. You do too much dissections, you have prominent implants, you bleed a lot, and also you end up with infection. If you look at all those complications, most of them are due to uh, uh, what, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the exposure, the surgery itself. So can we improve that by improving the surgical technique? And that's why percutaneous techniques now you know, are, are, are becoming better because they have less bleeding, less risk of infection, and you have early return to activity. As we work in the pelvis, we have to remember the, the real estate is very, very expensive, and that's very important. So many visceral organs, we have got uh, neurovascular structures, and so it's good to understand the anatomy very, very well before you delve in there. So let's start. So you have radiographic evaluation. We have our usual x-rays. You know, AP pelvis, you have an inlet and outlet view. And also, remember, when you're dealing with the pelvis, always remember contrast studies, and that is the sister urethrogram. And then now, very, very key, if you extract the pelvis, by, by, by and large, if you have a fracture for me, it's a rule. You always have to have a CT scan for you to be able to see well. This is, uh, uh, you know, uh, a cartoon. Uh, uh, basically, you're having a, a representation of what is an inlet view. So you have the beam coming in that direction. And so you're able to see from the top, 
okay? And then this is the outlet view. So the beam comes from, uh, from, uh, from the coded, you know, towards the circular uh, position, and you're able to see the second quite well facing you. So like that is S1, S1, S2, and that is S2. And also you're able to see the anterior column right in there. Okay, let's now start, uh, you know, going into, you know, cases, and I'll use the Young and Burgess classification to be able to stratify my cases so that you can look at each, you know, one by one. So we have got lateral compression injuries, anterior posterior compression, and also we have got vertical shear. I'll mainly dwell with the lateral compression and, uh, and, uh, and, what, and the anterior posterior compression in the interest of time. So in lateral compression type one, usually anteriorly you have superior and inferior pubic ramai fractures or symphysis disruption, and Posteriorly, usually there's compression of the sacrum, usually on the same side, but it can be contralateral. LC type 2, you have an LC type 1 injury anteriorly, that is the ramai fractures, and posteriorly you have a crescent fracture of the ilium. So let's start with the lateral compression type 1. You have a sacral fracture right in there through the sacrum, and on the lateral side, you have got a superior pubic ramai fracture and inferior pubic ramai fracture. How are we going you know, to take care of the sacral fracture? It is through the SI, uh, or the sacroiliac screw, what you can call an iliosacral screw. This is a very important landmark that somebody has to understand for you to be able to successfully be able to deploy a sacroiliac screw or an iliosacral screw. That is, that is the iliopontical ilio, ilio density. The iliopontical density, you know, initially it was described by a gentleman called Chief Prout and, and his colleagues. And the iliac cortical density is this black line. This black line, it represents the iliac portion of the sacroiliac joint. So as long as you're just below it or touching it, and you're not anterior here, and you're not posterior in, 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 into, the, into the spinal canal, then you're within a safe zone. So very, very important to remember that. It gives you a nice starting point. So that's very, very, very key. So it keeps you within the ilium, and then you never get out to go and hit L5 nerve root. And so after your, it gives you a starting point, the iliac cortical density, and so it allows you to do the patient when it's supine. And then now you go to the outlet and inlet views, one, for the outlet view to ensure you are above S1, which is right in there, okay? And here in the inlet view to ensure you don't come anteriorly here to hit L5, which sits right in here, and then you don't go into the spinal canal right in there. So I usually use a flexible drill bit for starters, and then I, I change it into uh, a to guide well. So there, the screw has been deployed, showing us it's a 7.3 screw, that's the inlet view, that's the outlet view. So it's within the bone, and here it is above the S1, which is right, right here. Very important. First case, 35-year-old male, he was post road traffic accident, and you can see he has got an LC type 1. He has got here, he's got a fracture right in there, he has got a fracture there. But when you look at it from the top, it's both sides actually. Yes, it's quite comminuted and quite comminuted, okay? And also he has got this anterior spine avulsion. It was several weeks out, so it was quite a challenge to go in and, 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 uh, and reconstruct it. But before that, let's introduce a very important concept. And that is being able to sit down at your CT scan place and be able to, to understand what is known as multiplanar reconstruction. So it's a very nice tool that actually is provided in the CT scan. Or if you are having a PAC system, you know, quick picture archiving classification system, you should be able to go in and be able to draw lines, these two blue and green line, with simultaneously. You have an axial cut, coronal cut, and a sagittal cut. So you're able to move such in a way that you are able to move this green line and it moves simultaneously here in a way that you're able to get the exact spot where you want to put in your screw. And for example, like if I've chosen, I'm going to put in my screw through here in the sagittal plane, automatically these three lines, these lines will be able to show me where am I passing in view of the S1 in the coronal image, and here in view of whether I'm going to go into the, into the spinal canal or going anteriorly to hit L5 in this axial cut. So it's a very nice thing, multiplanar reconstruction. So this is planning for one, and this on this other side is planning for S2. And you can see like this patient, the fracture actually exited way next to S2. So it's a quite unstable fracture. And so when, after doing that, very happy, patient has no sacrodysmorphism, done good planning, went in anteriorly, used 3.5 millimeter recon locking plates to fix the anterior fractures, and then deployed uh, our, an, an, uh, a, a screw. 
sacroiliac screw uh, posteriorly. So there is the screw deployed, showing us in the outlet view and also on the lateral view that's within the bone. Always remember the tip of the screw has to be within S1 to be able to, to be sure that you are safe. It's not going posteriorly into the spinal canal and not coming anteriorly. Always look at the tip. Your starting point, which shows the washer, can be anywhere, but your tip of screw has to be somewhere there. And most of the, actually, the body of it. Remember that, the body of it. So the head can be here, the head can be here, but the tip and most of the body has to be within S1. 38-year-old male caused road traffic accident. Looking at the X-ray, the reason I put the X-ray here, it looks very innocuous, but it's a, it belies a lot. You know, when you look at the CT scan, you can see here, what we were not seeing at the back here, all of a sudden we can be able to see, you know, a fracture in the second at the back right in there. And, you know, you look at it furthermore, you can see there is a fracture there and a fracture there and a fracture there. So it's a patient who is likely actually to end up with, is actually was having a lot of pain, is likely to end up with displacement. So, octaneous techniques, very easy to fix, went in anteriorly, through financial incision, found bruised abdominal wall content uh, structures, and went in and put in a locking plate, and then put in an iliosacral screw posteriorly. Inlet view, the it is, and outlet and the lateral view uh, showing uh, a successful deployment of the screw. This one, this uh, gentleman was very interesting. He already had, before the injury, because he was he actually, it's a truck that fell on him when he was underneath trying to uh, change the tire. His uh, iliosacro, uh, his sacroiliac joints, both of them were actually synostosed, this side and that side. So his failure was through here, through the left side. You can see that. And so, and then anteriorly, superior and inferior pubic remains. So it's like a, is a 54-year-old gentleman, don't want to do so much dissection, there is no much displacement, so ended up doing everything percutaneous. And so, put in a, a iliosacral screw and through then both uh, superior and inferior pubic remains deployed two uh, 7.3 screws. Attempts is challenging to put 7.3 screws. So remember, I've gone in and actually and I've blown off part of this uh, uh, fracture, uh, and this, sorry, this uh, fracture fragment. So you can actually uh, elect to put 6.5 or 5.5 screws if you have them. So here he is, he's healing quite well, ambulant, and has no pain. Lateral compression type 2 is a very interesting one. It's through the iliac queen. And it can be through the iliac queen, can be anterior to the sacroiliac joints, according to day classification type 1, anteriorly can be right through the center of the sacroiliac joint or can be way at the back there. So the two and the three actually can be fixed in the same way by deploying this iliosacral screw only. You don't need this screw right in here. For day type one, it's very interesting. So the sacroiliac joint usually is intact, but the fracture is through here. So you deploy a screw from the front. Sorry, this pictorial presentation, I don't use this type of screw. It's actually from the front as you're going to see. And you can actually put it through the sciatic buttress. An example is this one, 26 year old gentleman, road traffic accident, and he had got a head injury and hemothorax. You can see there's an iliac wing fracture there and a fracture right through the front. So how do you stabilize this? Because this is where the main stability is. There is his pneumocephalus and here he has got a hemothorax. You go to the technique of percutaneous sciatic buttress screw. So there are several views which, uh, you know, I, I, I want to emphasize today. And the first one is what is called the outlet of obturator bleed. So this is a skeleton, the pelvis is facing up. So this is an outlet view. And then you try and swing the CM to be able to come and see the, the, what, the, the, the obturator foramen and face. And so you have an outlet view and obturator. And it will show you what is called the flame sign or the teardrop sign. And here it is. And here are the two guide wires that have been deployed. So that, that gives you a starting point. But then how do you know you're above the, 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 the sciatic, greater sciatic node so that you don't hit the sciatic nerve? It is using the iliac oblique view. You can see the guide wire is there, and this is the greater sciatic notch. Exactly. So it's very, very important to ensure you are above that. And then how do you know you're between the two cortices of the ilium, you do what is called the rollover view or the inlet coaxial view. So you do an inlet and then you swing the CM towards to, to the top actually of the of the ilium. So that you can look at it from the top, what you call a coaxial view. And you can see the guide wire is here, the fracture is through here. So this is a sacroiliac joint. 
So this is the inner uh, table of the ilium. This is the outer table of the ilium, and the wire, guide wire is going in that direction. Let's, let's look at an example. This is for that patient. This is the teardrop on the obturator outlet view. You can see the teardrop, and then this is the rollover view showing the ilium from the top, right in there. So the screw should actually pass through right through here. And there it is, the screw has been deployed right through between this cortex and this cortex. And then looking at it in the iliac oblique view, it's above the greater sciatic notch. And then finally, you can see the screw with a nice bullseye showing you the cannulation. But one year old male, post road traffic accident, he had got this uh, day type one. And here it is, you can see most of it is anterior. So it's bringing these fragments together. And you can see, use this one here, this pin, as a, guy, as a joystick, and then this is the guide wire going in into the sciatic buttress. And so ended up deploying the, the screw, which is around 125, can go to 130, you know, depending on how big the person's pelvis is. And you can see you end up using a two to three centimeter incision to be able to deploy that screw. So there he is. We did not put a screw into the anterior column. Sorry, the x-rays are of poor quality, but you can see it is not displaced further and is healed quite well. Day type two usually is through the center of the sacroiliac joint. So the main thing is to bring this fragment to the sacrum. So that's very important. So you can actually put in a screw from the ilium to the sacrum. And so that's uh, looking at it in the 3D construction, you can see the sacroiliac joint is disrupted here and the fractures at the back. So bring this to that and also fix the front. So we started by fixing the front so it can help reduce whatever is at the back, very important. And then was using this pin here in the suprasetabular uh, uh, region as a joystick to help us reduce the fracture in front and at the back and then deployed the endosacral screw. Very important. LC type three is actually an LC type one or two, but on the contralateral side, you have got an, an anterior posterior uh, compression. That is the, the stasis of the sacroiliac joint or in the symphysis. So usually it's because of a rollover mechanism and that's why you, you injure one side and it goes further to injure the other side. So it's a, like a way what we call a windswept pelvis. So you injure this side and the force vector goes over and opens the other side. So that is an LC type three. An example here, as you can see, the X-ray initially when the patient arrived in casualty, had this kind of injury, you can see the symphysis pubis is, is opened up. Here, the sacroiliac joint is opened up. And this side, he had a sacral fracture, which is very subtle, which when you do the CT scan, actually shows you that even he had got a combination of a buckle of the sacrum, that is LC type one, and an LC type two. And on the other side, he had an LC type three. He came in and he had a pelvic binder applied. So when you look at the symphysis pubis, it looks very okay on this 3D when you're looking at it from the top, from the front. When you look at it from the top, you can see they are not equal. So actually the X-ray was actually helping us to complement the CT scan. When did they did the multiplanary construction planning and fixed the front, first fixed this fracture here, and then joined the, the, the symphysis. And at the back, because both sacroiliac uh, uh, joints had distractions, one in the sacrum side and one at the, at the sacroiliac joint portion, ended up with two sacroiliac screws. What about APC? APC, anterior posterior compression, usually the, the, the stasis anteriorly through the symphysis pubis, and then you have variable uh, or disruption at the back, which will determine, depending on the amount of, dis of, of uh, disruption at the back, to determine whether it's APC one, two, or three. So one usually is the innocuous one, which usually uh, most of the time as it is, you don't have so much disruption at the back, and so you can actually end up not doing anything uh, about it. APC type one, so actually can be let alone. But APC type two is where the problem is because you, you think about the, the, the pelvis as an as a, as a, as a osteoligamental structure. APC type two has most of the time sacrotibrous, sacrospinous ligaments are disrupted and anterior or sacroiliac joints ligaments are disrupted. APC type three, you have a complete SI joint disruption. So APC type two and three, they need to be fixed. So APC type two example is this one. Patient came in, had a combined, has a stabular fracture, and has two SI joint disruptions at the back. 
you know, as you can see on this axial cut, they see APC uh, type 2, anterior sacroiliac uh, ligaments are disrupted, disrupted, at the back they're intact. So what did you like to do? You close the book from the front and fix at the back and also had an acetabular reconstruction. So very, very important. So APC type 3, you have got complete disruption of the, of the what, posterior, of the sacroiliac ligaments, both anterior, interosseous, and also posterior sacroiliac ligaments. This patient had some degree of sacral dysmorphism. You can see the sacrum here is sloping on either side. But went in and, did, and looked at the multiplanar reconstruction and planned very well and realized can be able actually to sneak in as sacroiliac screws without actually getting into any nerve or injuring it. So what did he do? Went into the front, closed the book from the front and deployed because of the degree of instability of APC type three, deployed both an S1 and an S2 screw. You can see there is the S1 neuroprogramina. I also will jump directly because in the interest of time to combine the injuries. You can have combined vectors. Occasionally, in, uh, uh, occasionally you have two separate, two separate injuries. You have, for example, like you have, uh, somebody sitting straight up in a, on a motorbike is actually is uh, ejected. So basically, when his legs are straight, impact opens up, then he lands on the side. So you have an APC and uh, lateral compression, and you can also have an anteroposterior compression and vertical shear. So that's an that's arbitrary representation. So here is an example. This gentleman who had actually an APC disruption, landed on the side and broke his ilium right in there. As you can see, he's disrupted in front, and also here the back is broken. You know, he has got this uh, disruption. He had a huge morel lavalli lesion. And this showing you at the back, the V type of injury. So the issue is, how do you best approach this? The first thing is get what is easiest to reduce. And that is first reduce the symphysis pubis. So reduce that very well, get a good reduction, helps you reduce the rest. And then went in and deployed a sciatic buttress screw from anterior to posterior. And then was able, were able actually to use a long screw. We're very lucky to have it. It was around 123.5 screw and fix that iliac wing triangular fragment. And this gentleman actually ended up uh, doing quite well and were able to clean out the Morella Valley lesion. Here is another patient actually who was at uh, lateral compression and vertical shear. She actually, as you can see, there is destruction at the back and displacement posteriorly of the, uh, the, sacral, uh, the sacrum through uh, the neuroparamina and these two fractures here quite displaced. So went in and had, it was a little bit late. Actually, when she came in, she was brought in because they, they, had, taught, they had tried to, to actually manage an operatively for a few days, but she couldn't even lie on her buttocks. She was lying with her tummy. So that's one indication telling you that the patient had got actually sacral fracture. So fixed from the front, went in and deployed a screw at the back. It was a little bit late, didn't get a perfect reduction of the, uh, of, of the sacral fracture. But she had done neurologic fallout, so fixed it in situ, and she did quite well. And there she is several months later, no pain. Actually, she presented one year later with a baby. So I think I, I'll try and stop there.